Yeah, I, I believe that, you know, in the same way that every human being could be moved by the right piece of music, or it may take a long time to find that piece of music, I believe also every human being could be moved by a work of art or by some aspect of visual culture. Hi, my name is Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, medical doctor, author of The Four Pillar Plan and television presenter. I believe that all of us have the ability to feel better than we currently do, but getting healthy has become far too complicated. With this podcast, I aim to simplify it. I'm going to be having conversations with some of the most interesting and exciting people, both within as well as outside the health space, to hopefully inspire you, as well as empower you with simple tips that you can put into practice immediately to transform the way that you feel. I believe that when we are healthier, we are happier, because when we feel better, we live more. Hello and welcome to episode 49 of my Feel Better, Live More podcast. My name is Rongan Chatsky and I am your host. Before we start today's conversation, I would like to thank the sponsors, Art Fund, who are bringing you today's episode. Art Fund is the national fundraising charity for art. And in the past five years alone, Art Fund has given £34 million to help museums and galleries acquire works of art for their collections. You can find out more about Art Fund and the National Art Pass at artfund.org forward slash live more. My conversation today is about whether museums and galleries could potentially be an untapped well-being resource. It's no secret that we're facing unprecedented levels of anxiety. But what if there was a parallel world that offered us a different way of thinking about life? Director of the Art Fund and my guest today, Stephen Duker, believes that museums and art galleries offer just that. Stephen has been director of Art Fund since 2010 and has been closely involved with the introduction of the National Art Pass in 2011. This is a pass that allows people to enjoy free access to over 240 museums, galleries and historic places across the UK, as well as 50% off entry to major exhibitions. Prior to joining Art Fund, Stephen was the first director of Tate Britain and he was awarded a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2010. On the show today, Stephen talks about the fascinating findings of a recent report that found that actively deciding to take time for cultural activities and pursuits can have a profound impact on our overall well-being. He believes that every human could be moved by a piece of art or culture, and that there is something on offer for everyone. And it needn't take hours, even a short visit can be beneficial. After talking to Stephen, I feel inspired to explore the rich diversity of art that's on offer in society. I hope that you do too. So Stephen, welcome to the Feel Better Live More podcast. Thank you. Well, we're here in your very beautiful offices, I've got to say, here um, just behind King's Cross. And you have been director of the Art Fund since 2010. I think it would be useful to understand at the start of this conversation, what is the Art Fund? Well, we are a charity, a national charity. We've been around since 1903, so we're entering our second century. Uh, And our job has been to help museums initially just acquire works of art for their collections, but latterly to do all kinds of things for their visiting public. And we raise our funds from our mass membership. We have 140 or thousand so members. Uh, Each of them pays an annual subscription, Uh, That produces millions of pounds for us that we give away in grants. And they do that. They join us. They support us, not just because of the good work that we do, but because we also issue the National Art Pass, which is a means of access to museums and galleries and exhibitions across the country at free or heavily discounted rates. So it works for members of the public. It works for museums. um, And it works for us as a developing national charity. In some of your um, sort of documentation I've seen uh, about the art fund, it, you, you, you sort of put that museums and galleries are the UK's untapped well-being resource. And I really love that phrase and it really speaks to me because I feel that you know, arts and culture is a fantastic way for us to unwind, uh, spend our 
you know, our relaxation time, you know, many of us are struggling with anxiety, with stress, with overload. And I just wonder if you could expand as to why the Art Fund believe museums and galleries to be the UK's untapped wellbeing resource. Well, museums are something different, really. Um, Everyone works hard. Everyone has complicated home lives. These days, people are struggling to cope with the pressures of, of, of just simply daily life. And what museums offer is, is another world. I wouldn't just say an escape from the actual world, but a, a parallel, another kind of world that exists alongside our daily cares. It's a world that extends into history, takes you deep back into time through the centuries when you understand how other civilizations operated. But it also takes you into the minds and imaginations of artists and creators and curators who are operating uh, across the cultural field as a whole. And so you have the potential of a of a completely transformative experience, one that not necessarily brings you simply calm and relaxation to counteract the pressures of the modern world, but one that offers you a different, a kind of parallel way of thinking about life and, and its significance. So, so we see museums and galleries as a, as a resource that people should think about in, in a new way. Do you think enough of us around the country, I guess across society full stop, are thinking about museums and galleries as a way that we can, you know, de-stress, a way that we can actually enjoy um, our relaxation time, enjoy a bit of a switch off from the, you know, the trials and tribulations of daily, you know, personal life and work life? Or is it something you feel the Art Fund are needing more and more to raise awareness of? Yeah, we do think it's untapped. Uh, We uh, did a research project recently and published uh, the findings of that called Calm and Collected. Uh, And there were some rather interesting statistics and findings that that came through that. And and the most revealing one in some ways was that a very high proportion, something like two thirds of the thousands of people that were surveyed, said that at some occasion in the past, they had been to a museum or gallery as a way of relieving stress. And yet only a tiny percentage, something like 5 to 6% of people, regularly visited museums by consequence. In other words, people had discovered that museums and galleries did relieve stress, but they didn't then translate that into a new way of organizing their lives, a way in which culture and art and museums would play a more central part. So, so we've taken that to heart and we feel that we need to do everything we can to get people to introduce regular museum visiting to their their life framework. Why is it you think that there's such a, a stark difference between how many people in your survey, in your research, um, recognize how beneficial visiting museums and galleries can be versus the very, very small percentage of people who actually will regularly do that? What What's going on there, do you think? Well, it may be that the reputation of museums and galleries, you know, as places of learning and culture and instruction and education is so strong and so powerful that people find it difficult to imagine them as an ongoing resource for something quite different. So they may say, well, I went to a museum and I felt better, but they probably don't naturally think that if they went to a museum regularly, their life as a whole might improve, uh, which is something that we believe rather strongly. So in a sense, I think it's because of the strength and importance and power that museums and galleries already have, that it's quite difficult to change the way people think about them. What would you say to some people who may be listening to this podcast, thinking that, well, you know, I I sort of, I was dragged around museums when I went to school. I didn't particularly enjoy them. And they sort of, now in working life, you know, they're busy doing their things. And at the weekend, they might... I don't know, just be relaxing at home or in their local park or or spend a lot of time on technology, let's say, and watch YouTube or spend time on social media. What, what, how would you sell, as it were, museums and galleries to someone like that? Well, I think, you know, look at what museums are doing. Look at the range of museums in London alone. Um, you know, everything from the Science and the Natural History Museum through to contemporary art spaces and historic art places like the Wallace Collection, for example. Look nationally. Uh, at a range of museums, you know, the Football Museum at one end of the spectrum, uh, the Pier Art Centre in Stromness in Orkney, a, a small art gallery at another. There is an incredible range and there is something there 
for everyone. And I think that people are, to some extent, hamstrung by their memories of school visits or family visits. Usually, as you say, you know, they might have gone rather against their will. They probably didn't enjoy what they found very much. If they did enjoy it, it was probably because they were having a laugh with their friends rather yeah. than anything else. When you get to be an adult and an adult, you know, with a with a career and a you know working life and 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 a kind of complex structure around you, the place of the museum or art gallery in that world can be really quite different. Um, and people, I think, also make the mistake of thinking that going to a museum or gallery involves a massive commitment of, of time. They they fear that to do justice to visiting, let's say, the British Museum or the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, they're going to have to spend a couple of hours there. Well, I would say not true. And some of the most creative and interesting form of museum visiting is in the form of someone just popping in for five minutes to see a painting that they've seen in reproduction and they want to see the real thing or to return to a piece of sculpture that they once saw years ago and it had an impact on them. And yeah. and to go in with no great expectation. People are not expecting everyone who looks at every work of art to have a religious experience of some kind. It, they're often you know, spiritual improvement and advance takes a while to seep through. It's not about, you know, a quick hit. It's about something much more contemplative and slower. And and I like the idea that people can just wander into galleries, walk around, stop. If they're moved to stop, keep going if they're not. Yeah. Uh, and to, you know, enter into the spirit of museum visiting in a much more relaxed, less uh, instructive way. I think one of the keys is, as we've just touched upon, is, you know, as an adult, we can choose which museums and galleries we go to, whereas on, on previous family trips or, you know, on school trips, you know, that was allocated for us, we would have to attend. And therefore, you know, we may still have a hangover from those experiences. But you, you've just said, you know, you've got, we've got sort of football museums and galleries, we've got uh, music museums and galleries. We've got, yes, contemporary arts. We've got all kinds of different things. I know as a parent that um, if I take my kids to a museum, then, you know, I, I really feel that their, their eyes have been expanded to all kinds of other possibilities. And on the way home, there's all kinds of endless questions, which really makes me happy as a parent that actually they're starting to think about things in a different way. They're getting out of their daily and weekly routine and they're being exposed to something new. So I think that's really important. Um, are you seeing these benefits in adults and children alike or is the art fund particularly focused on, on one area here? Well, we're, you know, we're here to help museums and we believe that every single member of the population will benefit from going to a museum. So we don't discriminate. But what I would say is that I think there is a, there is a big difference between the experience of a of a child on a family visit to a museum and that child when they become a teenager let's say and they maybe go back to the same gallery that you know you took your son or daughter to you know last week you know in a few years time they may visit as a on their own and they will form a relationship with what they see that's quite different that they're not being expected to learn about the world in a in a different way as a result of what they see but they are reacting much more naturally to the kind of emotional impact of art on the walls or in showcases and so on yeah absolutely uh, when i looked through your report it was striking to see that um over half 53 percent of people in the uk felt some level of level of anxiety yesterday which is remarkable if we, we if we just think about the population um and I thought this stat was really, really key. Uh, about a quarter of people felt guilty about taking time out for themselves. And this is, as a, as a GP, this is something I'm seeing a lot of. This is one of the reasons I've written a whole book on stress, The Stress Solution, um, because I feel that stress is endemic in our modern lives. And all of us, whether we feel we're stressed or not, probably need some form of uh, stress busting strategy as it were and uh, obviously there's many things that people can do but your research is showing that actually you know spending time in the arts 
spending time exposed to culture is actually a great way of de-stressing. Mm. I mean, to look at things in sort of broader sociological terms, I suppose you could argue that Britain has a kind of Puritan past when the, you know, the idea of the work ethic became very strong. And that's, you know, stretching back across several centuries, really, and then re-injected with a new kind of, uh, of energy, not necessarily positive energy, in the era of, of Thatcher towards the end of the, of the 20th century, this sense that to be a productive, valuable human being, you need to keep yourself close to the grindstone, that it's all about work and, and, and productivity and output. And that therein lies prosperity therein lies meaning to life. And I think that what's interesting about the 21st century is that that is now being superseded by a new kind of ethos, which is much more about balance and wholeness and the idea of a kind of life portfolio where you mix together components of which work is one and productivity and everything that comes out of that, of course, is very important. But that your time on this planet you know, is here for you to use in lots of different ways too. And I think in, 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 in spiritual terms, I think that's a very, very important uh, and, and sophisticated advance for us to be making as human beings. Yeah, I think, Stephen, you raise lots of interesting points there. And I, I do think there's something about how life has progressed into the 21st century where we have felt that the more we do, the more productive we are. Let's not even take lunch breaks anymore. Let's work through. Let's keep, you know, on the, you know, if we're if we're commuting to work, let's do our emails on the commute on the way home so that we're getting ahead. And we almost need to reframe this whole idea that, um, you know, taking some time off or diverting your attention to something else is also productive because there's quite good science on that. That actually, if you stop, you know, stop doing a task that you are, you know, stop, let's say doing your work tasks and you divert your attention to something else. Actually, it's incredible. A different part of the brain switches on. Um, you help to solve problems. You help to be more creative. And we just can't work, work, work our way in, into the ground. And um, I know, for example, that I've spoken about before, that when we stop focusing on a task, like let's say we stop focusing on the spreadsheet we've got to do at work, and let's say we go for a walk for 10 minutes without our phones, a part of the brain called the, the default mode network goes into overdrive, which is surprising because we used to think that the brain will go to sleep when we weren't focusing on a task. But what happens, that part of the brain is responsible for... Um, solving problems and coming up with creative ideas. So that's why so many of us come up with ideas or these great ideas when, you know, we're doing something else. And I imagine the same would be for arts. If you, let's say you're working in an office Monday to Friday and on a Saturday morning, you pop into a museum for half an hour. I suspect that actually some of those problems you couldn't solve in the week would actually probably just come to you whilst you're focusing on something else. I think that's true. And if you... I mean, just take a couple of museums, I mean, thinking in London, let's say the National Gallery or in Edinburgh, the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. They're two just places where within two minutes of arriving in those buildings, you could find yourself immersed, in the case of National Gallery, in 16th century Italy, looking at images of, of saints and people having religious experiences you could go to the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art and find yourself looking at Damien Hirst and butterflies uh, and, you know, your view of the natural world around you and the human condition would be jolted in some particular way. And those are huge steps away from the reality that most people come from. So in a single glance, you can be through a, through a picture, you can be translated, transformed into another world. And I agree with you. I think that offers tremendous potential creative energy because certainly speaking personally, my best ideas do not come to me when I'm doing normal stuff, you know, routine stuff. They come to me when you know, I'm jolted out of the complacency of my own day-to-day -day existence, if you like, and I'm challenged by something. Yeah, I think that's the same for, for, for all of us, actually. And I, I think one of the... You know, as I as I as I was writing my book on stress, I 
I reflected a lot on where these stresses are in the modern world. And one of the things that I, I really thought about is how our downtime has been eroded out of society. That this whole idea where we could just daydream or um, not be doing something specific, you know, because of technology, because of emails, because of smartphones now, any bit of downtime, we're, you know, even if we're standing in a cafe waiting to order a coffee, our heads are stuck on our phone, we're reacting, we're, we're actually focused on something. And I think there's something about bringing downtime back and recognizing that actually, you know, downtime is good for us. Downtime is productive. If I notice that um, your calm and collected report, which is it available for the public to see at all? Yeah, it's available uh, online on the Art Fund's website, um, artfund.org. Yeah, it can be downloaded from there. Yeah, guys, I would recommend you actually take a look at that. It's a super interesting report. It's, uh, you know, relatively straightforward to understand and and uh, just see what research has been carried out. But uh, professor, I think it's Professor Paul Dolan, who, you know, I've read one of his earlier books, I think it's Happiness by Design, I thought it was an absolutely fantastic book. He also endorsed this report, didn't he, and got involved. Was that something, you know, was that to try and look at the the health impact of, um, you know, of, of getting involved with art and museums? <laughs> Yes. I mean, one of the things that, um, one of the accusations that you could level at a charity like ours, if you were being unkind, was to say, well, it's all a bit elitist, isn't it? That you are, you're serving the world of, you know, fine art and you're raising money to buy extremely expensive objects and so on. And in the end, there are many more important causes. There's life and death and health and, and, and so on. So just w tell me why exactly arts and museums do matter. And so, you know, as a, as a charity that doesn't want to be complacent for a moment, we began to think much harder about, if you like, the social value, the human value of, of museums and galleries beyond you know, the traditional sense that they are the national collection, they're collections of, of collections of works of art and so on that are maintained for posterity to so people understand how history works. We were rather interested to discover the kind of human impact they could have. And so, you know, we talked to Paul Dolan about the possibility of doing some research and that's really how the, the, the project came about. Did Paul help actually sort of implement the research was that one of Paul's roles or did he help to interpret it for uh, you yeah he helped he helped with the interpretation and and he helped to to add messages if you like to the data that was coming out of the report and you know this idea that that every individual should try to create 30 minutes in every day when they do something different uh, and that something different should routinely regularly include museum and gallery visiting. Um, and I would say, you know, moving on from that, it's not necessarily just about going to one museum regularly. It's about exposing oneself to the potential and possibilities of museums of, of all kinds. You know, if you, if you like art, don't just go to art museums, you know, go to history museums and science museums as well and natural history. Uh, it's, there is this wider world that's waiting. Yeah, and I think there's so many things I want to talk to you about. I mean, that makes me feel, makes me think a little bit about how we've all got, you know, many of us feel in a rut these days. Days turn in, into weeks, weeks turn into months. We do the same thing. We look at the same social media feeds. We go, to, you know, we eat the same sorts of foods. And there is something about doing something different and what it does for our brain in terms of different neural connections and pathways. Um, and, and I feel what you're saying is to try to, yes, try and engage in culture, but try different things, um, which I think is really important. You mentioned life and death. There's clearly lots of very important things to do with life and death in the world. Um, but we're pretty good now in Western society in terms of life and death on so many levels. And where I think art and culture come in so much is that they, you know, they're part of the fabric of our our lives and our experiences and, and what cultures have lived before us, what cultures are going to live after us, what can we learn from looking back into the past. And I think uh, in many ways, I think it's never been more important as it is now, particularly in this um, technological world. In fact, do you feel that in this digital world that we're now living in, there is something unique about the sort of analog experience of visiting a museum or a gallery? 
I do. Um, I, I mean, I've been in the museum world previously as a curator and director and so on for a long time. And one of the things that I remember we all worried about in the 1990s when digital technology began to take off was that somehow the museum would be superseded, that people would be able to get images of works of art and collections of different kinds. And so they wouldn't need to to see the real thing. And was this effectively the beginning of the end uh, of museums? And of course, precisely the reverse has occurred. What digital technology has done is it's made it possible for everyone to be aware of the incredible range and depth of stuff there is to see and that people then want to follow that up with a, a visit. And they wouldn't keep doing that if the experience of the visit wasn't somehow very impactful. And I would say an important point to make is that, you know, in viewing what museums have to offer, it's not necessarily always a calming, even pleasant experience. Sometimes looking at a, a work of art can be deeply disturbing and upsetting. And I would argue it could also be very beneficial. Uh, photography often contains very shocking mm. images that make one think about the human condition in, in different ways. Think of artists like Jake and Dinos Chapman, who, who, you know, the, the shock value of their work is, is fantastically high. And, and part of their impact on the world has been precisely because of that. And so it's the complexity of the experience of art, which I find intriguing and it's why it's so rich so you don't necessarily know that when you go to a museum you don't know exactly what kind of experience you're going to have and it could be one that involves laughter you know there's a lot of humor uh, to be found uh, in art it could be something much more profound it could be something very banal uh, and it's that you know almost infinite range of possibilities that i i find uh, so interesting yeah i think there's something really um magnetic these days about you know there's real life experiences because so much of our world is digital now I, i'm i'm intrigued by that so are our sort of visitor numbers going up now you uh, is that right are visitor numbers going up now compared to how what they used to be oh yeah i mean if you look at the the number of visitors to museums today as compared to 20 years ago let's say the kind of pre-digital era or just immediately pre-digital era it's they've gone up hugely yes. that, that's yeah. so fascinating Stephen. to me so fascinating that we can look on our phone now at images of the paintings that we might see in a museum or a gallery. Um, yet there, there is something, I, I think we are craving a you know, connection. We're craving something more than what we see on our computers or our phones. And that may in some part be related to why uh, people are going so much. It's, it's funny, like things like vinyl, you know, and even CD players are coming back into fashion because people and myself, I certainly include myself in this as a music fan, um, but there's something about the way digital has made music so in many ways disposable. You can get a tr any track you want, you can delete it, you can you, you can easily flick between things. Whereas there, there's for me, there's a certain magic in actually holding the album well and of course live performance in, live in performance. music terms in life of, compared today with 20 years ago i mean now that's where everyone makes their money isn't it exactly it's live performance whereas 20 years ago it was exactly the opposite that tours were you know where you lost your money and record sales were where you recovered yeah it. and it's so, ironic that any tour now that you see on you know you can see footage of whatever musical tour you want to see on YouTube. You could watch that. Yet still the tendencies are growing because we're craving something about that human experience, about bonding with other people. And I guess that leads to a wider point, which is, do you feel that there is a social element as well when people go to a museum and gallery? And is that really, really important, particularly with rising levels of loneliness in, in society? Well, it's certainly true that a lot of museum visiting is done as a social experience. So people, in other words, go in groups of two or more people, and quite a lot of people go in, in pairs. But by no means, that's not the case by any means, uh, exclusively the case. Um, you know, single visits, the, you know, the quiet contemplative experience of an individual communing with what they see is as valid as, you know, the animated conversation with a group of friends um, in, in, in front of a display. There is no single way, there is no right way to visit. But I do believe 
the social dimension to be generally important. And I think when it comes to to special exhibitions, and exhibitions are something that we at the Art Fund, you know, support very strongly, and our members who, you know, with their art passes, use the, the discounts and so on that we offer as a means of consuming exhibitions. And the number of great art and other exhibitions across the museum world is, is incredible at the moment. And they are events of almost a kind of participatory kind. Sometimes it can be a bit innovating because you could be queuing behind people to, you know, large numbers of people to see a particular work. But just the energy that can be generated by large numbers of people enjoying what they see, animated by what they find, can be... Uh, it can be really, uh, you know, life enhancing. Yeah, I think there's something about um, being in a group of people, you know, be, being out with other people who've got similar interests, similar passions. Um, whether you know them or not, you know that clearly there is some sort of uh, common desire for them to be there. There's something special about that. I recently spoke to the CEO of Parkrun, and Parkrun is this big global movement that actually is really, as he puts it, a social intervention masquerading as a running event. It's really about that community feeling. And I do feel that there's something about this in this era of loneliness when, you know, many of us have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of social media friends, yet no one to have dinner with on a Sunday night. And I think I could see how museums and galleries could play a role here for people to actually go and spend some of their leisure time doing something with other like-minded people. Um, I know part of the report was talking about how we can reframe the idea of a museum or gallery visit. And I was intrigued by uh, the term of a micro visit. Can you tell me what a micro visit is? Well, I think... I would say a micro visit, a typical micro visit is someone popping into a museum for literally three minutes to look at a single work of art or display or just something that they find attracts their attention the moment they walk in. Or as I was saying earlier, something that they might have previously seen that they want to renew their acquaintance with. And sometimes just the kind of hit that you get from stepping off the street into another world and gazing intently at something for a short period can be very affecting uh, and restorative uh, and powerful. And so that's, yeah, for that's what the, the micro visit can be. Yeah, I like it. You know, taking away this idea that it has to be a whole day out or the whole afternoon, you can just pop in and actually experience some of the things it has to offer. Um, you mentioned before about the the potential to be Potential for people say this is quite elitist and only a certain section of society are interested in this sort of thing. Um, in terms of museum and gallery attendances, have you noticed that there is a difference between the socioeconomic um, sort of status of, of attendees? You know, are we seeing particular groups attending museums and galleries more? And, you know, I guess the further the follow-up question would be if there are certain groups who are not attending as much as we would like, what can we do to try and make it more attractive for them to do so? The spectrum is broadening all the time. There's no question about that. But equally, I would acknowledge that there are some people who think that museums and galleries are not for them. There can be quite scary places. I mean, you know, when the Victorians built all those museums across the country, they put big Roman-style porticos on them to make them look as imposing uh, and important as possible. And, and that, these days, has a somewhat negative effect. So there are some people who, who don't want to go to museums and find the process of conversion somewhat difficult. But what I would say, again, looking at the kind of recent history uh, of this country and to some extent, you know, beyond this country, there has been a kind of revolution, I think, of taste. People are more interested in the contemporary. There used to be this sense in Britain that we worship the past. You know, we were a country that, that lived on our traditions and, our, and on our heritage. And I think perhaps beginning from the 1990s when the young British artists, Tracy Emin, Damien Hirst, Sarah Lucas, and so on, came to, to prominence. And they were full of humor uh, and vitality and energy, celebrating 
you know, the, the, the moment, rather perhaps like the kind of punk era did in, in, in music. And slowly that began to have an impact on, on mainstream society, that people began to think in terms of what was great about Britain's present and great about Britain's modern production. And that led to a kind of, uh, I would say, a spirit of informality and relaxation and energy that infused even the most traditional museums. You know, you go to the British Museum or the V&A today and you will not find, you know, a, 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 a kind of stolid, slow, silent place. You'll find a place teeming with vitality uh, and energy. And I would say that comes from the kind of contemporary spirit which infuses museums. Now, all of those things are going to help break down prejudices um, against visiting and will continue, I believe, to extend the social spectrum of, of people who visit. So, you know, I still wish everybody in the country would go to museums. We're not that far away from that, actually. In fact, you know, very high proportion of people have been at least once. And on a Saturday, and take any Saturday in the football season, and you'll find that more individuals are going to museums than football matches, believe it or not. So, I mean, that's uh, an incredible it's, statistic it's that, that, that surprises me. And if you had given me a sort of a true false um, sort of... <laughs> You know, dilemma on that. Yeah. I would have said false. So I'm. It's well, I may be making this up, but <laughs> no, I'm sure you're not. You, you, you're clearly very driven to um, really spread the word of um, art and culture and how you know and and what kind of effects it can have. Yes, on our individual well-being, but also on society as a whole. I think it's really that important. Um, I, I like in, in your report that we, we you sort of talk about. We've got to give ourselves permission not to like or understand everything on display, you know, and that really, that really is about going in there with that open mind and thinking, actually, you're not going to love everything, but actually being exposed to it will have some benefits. And um, it's remarkable to see that the overall research that you, that, that you did showed that actively deciding to take time for cultural activities and pursuits can have a profound impact on overall well-being. Uh, and, you know, in you know, as a doctor, I, I see so many people day in, day out who, you know, their, their lives just happen. They're on a treadmill from, from week to week, from day to day, from month to month. And they're so focused on what they need to do. They forget about things that they would love to do or they would like to do. And once you start to, this is something I spend a lot of time doing with my patients is sort of trying to identify what's missing in their life. And once you can help persuade them that it's important for them to do that, it is amazing how many downstream so-called medical problems can start to improve when people actually, you know, have that rich tapestry of life and, and different cultural experiences. And I have also seen that when I worked in Oldham, which is, you know, I worked in a practice there, which is, uh, it was a pretty deprived area in terms of um, income. Lots of my patients were on benefits at the time. But, you know, when we talk about these different socioeconomic groups, actually doing things that involved culture, that involved community, doing things with other people, had a profound impact on their overall well-being. And I guess you would th you, you feel that, that museums and galleries can play a similar sort of role. I do, but I don't believe it's possible to promise or describe exactly the kind of benefit that the people are going to get. And I think that one of the barriers that exist to people visiting museums is that they don't really know what kind of experience they're going to have. Or that I would say they're not even sure they're going to have an experience that they will consider meaningful. And that's just getting back to your your point about people thinking that museums and galleries are maybe not for them and how we how we begin to change thinking on those lines. And and I'm completely, you know, comfortable with the idea that for some people, a visit to a museum may not be a very profound experience. It may just simply be a, a fairly pleasant one. It could be that the best bit of the museum visit is actually going to the shop or having a cup of tea afterwards. Yeah. Or if you're a four-year-old child, it's running at high speed from one end of the gallery to the other. It's not looking at the stuff. It takes different people in, in different ways. And so, you know, if I was, you know, in your position as a, as a doctor trying to help individuals, I wouldn't be saying to them, you know, go to 
the Tate next week, it'll change your life. But I will be saying, go and try it out. Go to the Tate, but also go elsewhere. Go to other kinds of places. Look at culture in all its forms. And, you know, you'll soon begin to discover whether it has an impact on your, your life or not. And I think this, you know, we often say to people, you know, no experience is required. No expertise is needed in order to get something from art. You know, art is... It's what it means to the viewer. It's not about the artist's intention. People often think that the first job to be tackled when you look at a work of art on the wall is to say, what's it about? What did the artist mean? I really don't believe that. I think the first task is to level with yourself and say, what impact is this work having on me? And sometimes the answer is it isn't having an impact on me, and that's fine because then you move on to the next one. You know, Stephen, it's, it, it's making me think about our analogy with music again in the sense, of course, music is a part of cult, it is a form of culture. It's not dissimilar to museums and galleries on one level. But, you know, for people who think museums are not for them or galleries are not for them, very few of us would say that music is not for us, right? If there was, you know, if your best friend raves about, you know, a particular album and you listen to it and sometimes you think, Oh, that's not really my cup of tea. That you don't go off music per se. You just you recognise <laughs> exactly, that you exactly. recognise actually and that actually that doesn't sort of yeah. stimulate me in the same way it stimulates yeah, my body. You don't, exactly, you don't feel remotely guilty if you hear a piece of music and you don't like it. You exactly, just move on quickly. Where, yeah, whereas <laughs> I don't quite feel that societally we look at art and museums in the same way. And maybe that's quite a nice analogy for people: is that hey. Try it out with an open mind. If something resonates with you, great. If it doesn't, fine. But there might be another museum or gallery where it does resonate with you. and Or as you've already said, it doesn't matter if it doesn't. There's still something about that experience, that exposure to something different. Uh, I think there's something quite powerful in that. Yeah, I, I, I believe that you know, in the same way that every human being could be moved by the right piece of music, or it may take a long time to find that piece of music. I believe also every human being could be moved by a work of art or by yeah. some aspect of visual culture. I mean, that's incredible. And I guess even on, on that note, um, which is really empowering for people, and, and I hope people who are listening to this, some people who may not have visited a museum or gallery recently, maybe have you know, either a positive or a neutral or even a negative memory, you might be thinking, well, actually, you know what? Maybe this is something I can now do. The, the, the sort of art funds have something called the National Art Pass. Um, and I think the idea is to make visiting more affordable and, you know, to, to, to sort of get what to really encourage more attendees. Can you tell me a little bit about the National Art Pass? How long it's been going for? What's the idea behind it? Yeah, well, if you join the Art Fund, um, you um, you get a magazine, you get a huge array of digital services telling you what's going on all over the country. But the, the principal component is a piece of plastic, the National Art Pass, which gives you free admission to a whole range of museums and galleries that have charges or discounted admission, particularly to, to exhibitions. So if you go to an exhibition at Tate Modern and the ticket is £20, you get in for, for 10 So the cost of buying the National Art Pass, which for you know someone under 30 is £45. For the year. Uh, for the year. Yeah, is bad. very, very quickly recovered. You just need to go to a couple of of exhibitions and you've got your money back. So it's a way of incentivizing individuals to go and visit, which the museums love because their visitors increase. And the money we raised through selling the pass and selling membership, um, you know, provides the program of grants that we give to museums to help them buy works of art, tour exhibitions, make publications, have conferences, uh, and, and so on. So we're a kind of, uh, uh, a middleman, if you like, we're using public enthusiasm for art and museums to generate cash to support museums, but also at the same time to deliver to our members, to the National Art Pass holders, an amazing world of, uh, of special access. So, so there's a discount for the under 30s, which is £45, and for the, the sort of 30s and above? Uh, it's seven, £70 is full, and then there is a you know, you can go as a double, 
which I think is 105, you can have a plus one membership and so on. So there's all range of things. But the main thing is that it's, it's priced at a level, which means that all you need to do is to go to a museum a few times a year and you've got your money back. So just in kind of cash terms, it makes sense. But what we're trying to do is something slightly more profound than simply give financial value. We're really trying to use this pass. The word pass is, is carefully thought through. It's like a passport to another kind of world. You know, it's a bridge to something different beyond one's people, pe people's ordinary lives. Yeah, I really like that. I like that idea and that concept. And just hearing you describe the, the art pass and... Yes, it's for the individual to get um, more access and, and you know better value access. But but the one that really stood out for me is that actually by contributing to it, you'll help. You know, we're helping to support this movement to get culture more mainstream in society, to get more people from different backgrounds exposed to it. Because ultimately, all these things need money. All these things need uh, resources to, to get the best art, to actually, you know, probably to look after the museums, to, you know, the day-to-day day -day admin of actually running uh, a sort of building. I'm sure it doesn't come cheaply. So um, I think, yeah, for people who are interested, yes, I think it's going to help you individually, but I think it also helps societally as well. Yeah, it's, you know, if you like, it's a kind of ethical purchase. It, it's, a, it's a product which is fantastic for you. It's a really great thing to have, and you're going to gain from it financially and spiritually. But also, in the process of acquiring it, you are doing good for others. You're supporting museums and therefore other museum audiences. So it's a very, you know, sociable thing to be doing from all points of view. Has your research shown that there's any um, gender difference between people attending museums and galleries? Do more men or do more women attend or do you not have that sort of data? I believe it doesn't come out in this uh, survey, but I believe that there is a slight uh, uh, female bias in relation to art museums and a slight male bias in relation to uh, science and history museums, which you could say is fairly predictable in the way that, you know, society has, has evolved. But I do know those things are changing. And I don't believe that, you know, you could easily make generalizations on a gender basis about, um, about most museums these days. One of, one of the striking things for me um, when, I, when I read your report was this direct correlation between the frequency of museum visits and our reported well-being with higher life satisfaction results for those visiting once a month or more. That's really powerful. So, you know, we're essentially saying there's a correlation, I guess I must be very careful not to sort of imply causation here, but there's a correlation between people who regularly visit museums and, you know, having a greater satisfaction with life. Um, have Has any of the research directly looked at benefits on our health when people visit museums and galleries? Well, as I say, I think we'd all have to be careful not to make uh, Over you know, it. Yeah, yeah two, two wild claims. But for the people that do regularly visit, they at some level actually become dependent on it because they find that their lives are given more balance uh, and a greater sense of depth and, uh, and richness. And therefore they find that if they don't regularly expose themselves to culture of this kind, then their life their lives seem incomplete in some ways. So, uh, you know, we're only reporting what people tell us, which is that if you go to museums regularly, you look at art and museum displays and exhibitions regularly, you know, your life will potentially feel calmer and fuller. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're pleased with that, that, you know, the results are confirming what we've long believed. I was just thinking back the, the way you're describing it, it and the way you talk about the, the national art pass and the word passport. You know, we say that travel broadens the mind. I know for me personally, when I, when I travel, when I'm away somewhere else, you think about things in a different way. You can reflect on your own life differently. You come back with new ideas and, and new concepts and think, oh, you know, maybe I could do this a little bit differently. And, it, and in many ways, we can get some of those benefits by you know by escaping our our daily sort of normal worlds and entering the world of a museum or gallery because it will take us to a different place very much like travel on one element without you know having to get on a plane and do security no, checks and things no, like no, that no, you're, you're quite right it's it's potentially transformative i suppose you could say from two points of view firstly intellectually and secondly aesthetically you know you can see something that you find very beautiful and that can be give intense 
pleasure can have very you know positive uh, enhancing effects just by experiencing beauty or color in a particular form and intellectually when you think about meaning or your view of the world is jolted slightly by an image that as i was saying earlier you know you might find disturbing as as well as um profoundly moving um but from those two different points of view the the power to transform you from where you are in your actual life to where you are in your head or your eye or your mind um, is really important. Well, Stephen, look, I think the work um, you and your team here at the Art Fund are doing is incredible. I think it's very much needed. You've certainly helped me reframe the way I look at museums and galleries. In fact, I'd probably say I probably haven't been as much as I would like to. In fact, I'd probably say that's not something I regularly do, but I'm going to commit that I'm I think this this very weekend, I am going to now visit something local in Manchester, which is where I live, um, with my wife, maybe with my kids if they're around, we'll see, um, because I, I can see the benefits. And, and like many people these days, I do feel overwhelmed from time to time. I do feel that life is stressful. I think this could be a great thing for me to get in to for, for my personal well-being, for hopefully my family's well-being as well. Any final words, Stephen, for people listening to this who might feel inspired, anything you know, any any last words to actually see if people will actually go and, you know, maybe get this art pass and actually go and visit some museums and galleries? Yeah, I would say make a plan. You know, first of all, decide that you're going to devote a certain amount of time every day or every week or re- every month to looking at museums, looking at art in a new way, even if you've never done it before. Just take the plunge and make that commitment. Secondly, do a bit of research, find out what's going on. You know, the Art Fund website, artfund.org will tell you what's going on in museums all over the country. Uh, Thirdly, make a plan with your friends or your family and say, okay, we're going to do this together. Um, And once you've found out where things are, you've found out who you want to go with, you then buy your art pass um, and off you go. Um, And yeah, give it a try. Well, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate your time today. I think it's a very much needed uh, movement. I wish you and the Art Fund all the best with this. For people listening who do take the plunge and do set a date, like Stephen has suggested, we would love to know. The Art Fund are on social media. I'm on social media. Please do tag us both. Let us know what you thought of today's episode. Let us know which museum or gallery you're going to visit. Uh, And also let us know, of course, if you do join up and buy one of these National Art Passes. Thanks for your time today, Stephen. Thank you. That concludes today's episode of the Feel Better, Live More podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and that it has hopefully been a great reminder about the existence of museums and galleries and how they might serve as a fantastic stress reliever. I really do think that for many of us, they are an untapped well-being resource. You can see everything that Stephen and I discussed today by going to the show notes page with this episode, drchatty.com forward slash art fund. As always, do let Stephen and I know on social media what you thought of today's episode. You can find Stephen on Twitter using the handle at art fund and me in all the usual places. Please do use the hashtag feel better live more or FBLM so that I can easily find your comments. You might be interested to know that Art Fund has their own podcast, Meet Me at the Museum, which is also hosted on Acast. It's funny and conversational and fantastic if you need a little bit of inspiration to plan your museum visit. If you want to find out more about Art Fund and the National Art Pass, you can visit artfund.org forward slash live more. Now, stress is a topic that came up a lot in my conversation with Stephen today. And as a doctor, I'm seeing symptoms of stress every single day in my practice. That was one of the big motivations for me to write my new book, The Stress Solution. This book helps you to identify the four big stress superhighways that exist in the 21st century and importantly gives you simple, actionable tools that will help you live a happier and calmer life. You can order your copy of The Stress Solution right now in paperback, Kindle, or in the audiobook which I am narrating. All international book links for The Stress Solution are available at drchastity.com forward slash book. If you do enjoy my weekly podcast, please do consider leaving a review, which really helps us support the show. You can also help me spread the word by taking a screenshot right now and sharing with your friends and family on your social media channels, or you can simply tell your friends about the show. 
Your support is very much appreciated. That's it for today. I hope you have a fabulous week. Make sure you have pressed subscribe and I'll be back next week with my latest conversation. Remember, you are the architects of your own health. Making lifestyle changes always worth it because when you feel better, you live more. I'll see you next time.